All right, Romans chapter number 15. We're continuing our look verse by verse. Now, I'm excited about this one because I started seeing something that um, I hadn't seen before when it comes to giving and the importance of it, giving towards the grace message. So much so that the Apostle Paul is going to mention it in this light. He's going to say, the things I'm showing you guys from the Lord are undescribable. He uses the word unspeakable, but, but in other words, it's going to be undescribable. Just bear with me. Go with me to chapter 15, where we, where we uh, left off in the verses about the poor saints of Jerusalem. Now, during the time of Paul, the little flock of Israel was still on the earth, during the beginning of the dispensation of grace. And what I mean, those messianic Jewish kingdom saints who sold all that they had. We all know about that, right? But as the dispensation of grace went on, and because they were rejected, I'm talking about the little flock from the other Jews in Israel and so forth, and it was hard for them to be employed and stuff, their money began to run out and dry up, and there was the dearth and so forth, the, the drought and so forth in book facts. Well, all these things made it so that they needed assistance from the Gentile churches that the Apostle Paul had established. <clears throat> Let's read that. Verse number 25, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. We already know it's those poor saints of Jerusalem. Peter says, remember the poor, Galatians 2.10. For it hath pleased. Now the key word in verse 26 is has pleased them. Of where? Macedonia, Achaia. Now, what we're going to see is that that's the area of Corinth and so forth. Paul already wrote books to those people, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. What we're going to see from 1st and 2nd Corinthians, why it pleased them to do what they're going to do here. Verse 26. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So those are little flock members. Now in verse 27, it just stands out in my mind. God's, Paul says, when you pray for God to open up, uh, enlighten the eyes of your understanding, as we learn in Ephesians, watch what he says here. It hath pleased them verily. Now why would Paul mention how it pleased these Gentiles to give? You're about to find out today. It pleased them verily, truly. And their debtors they are. They owe this. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their, that's the little flock, spiritual things, those spiritual things in Christ, the Gentiles' duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at all those. We began looking, verse number 28, when therefore I have performed this, when I take this out to these saints in Jerusalem. Now notice, and have sealed unto them this, what? Fruit. The key is this fruit. Today's topic is fruit that abounds. So I'm going to show you some things that I saw from the Apostle Paul. That if all the Christendom preachers and teachers who go all the way back to the Malachi and the tithes and offerings and so forth. If they just listened to Paul and knew what Paul has to say about giving. You would never have to go back there and compel people to give from verses that don't speak to us anyway. It's talking to the nation of Israel. Because if you can get saints to see what Paul is saying, why it pleased these people. And as I'm reading Romans, I say, what Paul says it pleases them, we can go back and actually find why it pleased them in these books to the Corinthians, first and second Corinthians. But we'll do that in a moment. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed this, this ministry of, to the saints, and have sealed, delivered to them this fruit. Notice Paul calls this contribution fruit. We'll see why. I will come by you into Spain. Now go with me to Philippians chapter 4. You can leave Romans for a while. Go to the book of Philippians chapter 4. We want to get the mind of Christ through Paul's epistles on this issue. Because when Paul ends 2 Corinthians 9, he says, Thanks be to God for, this uns for his unspeakable gift. It blows me away why Paul says that. And I hope I can give it to you guys. So just hold on. Look at Philippians 4. We're in Philippians a lot in our study on Wednesday of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, so forth. Notice Paul, they're helping him with his ministry. Notice at verse number, uh, Philippians 4, let's just start in verse 15. Everybody got Philippians 4, 15. Now ye Philippians know, he met them in Acts 16, as you know. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when he first came to them with the gospel of grace, Acts 16, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but who? Ye only. At that point in Paul's life, 
the only church of Gentiles that was communicating, working with the Apostle Paul for his benefit, particularly, was the Philippian church. Okay, you know the the woman um, Lydia and so forth. Everybody know about that Acts sixteen. If you don't read Acts sixteen, verse number sixteen. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Even when Paul left Philippi, went to Thessalonica, they were sending money to Paul to provide for his it, its provision for his physical and carnal needs. When I say carnal, not in the evil way, his physical needs. Okay, they provided for him. Keep reading. Now watch what Paul says in verse 17. Paul understood something. He's going to teach us through his epistles about what God thinks about when you invest in a grace ministry. Get this. Not, not because I desire a gift. He says, I, that wasn't the purpose. It's your right for you to take care of me. They which preach the gospel should live of it. 1 Corinthians 9. But Paul understood something even greater than them taking care of him as a minister. He understood something that was happening on their behalf. Verse 17, not because I desire a gift. Paul says, not about me, really. But I do, des I desire what? Fruit that may what? Abound to your account. Paul understood that their investing in his ministry was fruit that, fruit that abounds. And what he's talking about is at the judgment seat of Christ. Your things are abounding, and particularly this issue of giving. If, 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 if preachers knew this, they would never have to go to the Old Testament and Malachi, tithing off and so forth, and compel people to give. Because they could teach right from Paul what Paul says about it, and people will be even more motivated to give. Watch this. We'll come back to Philippians 4.18 and so forth, but right now I just want you to see his fruit that abounds. Now, we already saw last week... Uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians 16. We saw how he was doing this. If it pleased them, we can actually see in 1 Corinthians why it pleased them. Well, first, we already went through last time. We're just going to read a couple verses for a review. It's in the next, it's in the video from last week. Verse chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, same poor saints of Jerusalem. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia. Even so do ye. So Paul was doing this with all these Gentile churches. Upon the first day of the week, how it applied to us, that would be today, Sunday. Let every one of you lay by him in store. So he's between, as God has prospered him. So every person sees how God has prospered them, and they lay by them in store. There's the principle, that there be no gatherings when I come, and so forth. So he kind of shows how, how to give. Consistently, this way based upon you and God, not any compelling from tithing off and what it's just understanding what God's doing through the Apostle Paul. Now go to 2 Corinthians 8, where we left off. Now we're just going to read down through these two chapters, 8 and 9. You can see it. When you read Paul, I tell people to read Paul. And if they have questions, contact me. So let's say you're reading through the Apostle Paul. You've read Romans. You've read 1 Corinthians. Then you get to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. You say, well, what is this all about? Let me show you. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you the wit, or we want you to understand and know of the what of God. Paul is about to describe essentially what the grace of God is all about. Get this. Which was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Now let me get my map, just so you can get a view of this. I'm thinking about it. Paul's apostolic journey. Okay? Put that up there. If you can't see this on the video, sorry about that. You, you probably have one of these in, in the Bible. So here's Macedonia, Achaia, there's Corinth, and he goes around he, everywhere from Galatia. Like he's, he's collecting for his ministry, for his, for his own needs, and for those at the poor saints of Jerusalem as long as they um, exist. Now, that was a transitional truth. There's no more little flock to provide for. The only provision is for the grace ministry, the minister ministry now of grace. The little flock is gone now. They, they won't come back until the day of the rapture. Okay. All right, here we go. Look at uh, verse number two. How that in a great trial of affliction. So they're suffering. They're suffering. What they're suffering is, like we, we suffer in our economy today, poverty. <laughs> a great trial of affliction. The abundance of their joy. Why did it please them? Why did they have joy? Watch this. By the way, go back to verse one again. The great, I want you to understand the grace of God bestowed. That word bestowed is the word gift, like the word gifted. 
God, God gave them an opportunity to bestow is to grant something or to give some. So I want you to look at that word bestowed because it's going to come back at the end. OK, it's a gift. It's a, a grant. He's he's given them something very special. He bestows his grace upon them. In what way? Watch this. Verse two, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. See, they understand. We understand them. They understand us. There's deep poverty, especially here in California, Sacramento County, abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So although they were in that situation, because of what they understood of what Paul was saying, how things is going to bow to their account at the judgment seat. You got to teach this judgment seat. It's not just the bad. It's the good, too. They were able to be very liberal. Verse number three. He's going to tell us for further explanation to their power. That means their ability. I bear record. Yea, And even and beyond their power. So to their as God has prospered them. But some are going to say, wait a minute. Beyond that. They were willing of themselves. This was a choice they made knowing the truth. Praying us. I mean, they're praying. They're begging Paul. Praying us with much entreaty. Think about that. They're saying, please do this, Paul. They understood what Paul was, what God is doing. They said, please do this, Paul. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the what? Gift. gift. And that was the gift that they taken for the poor saints. And take upon us the what? Fellowship. Remember Paul talks to the Philippians about the fellowship in the gospel? Particularly he was talking about them supporting the <coughs> ministry. The fellowship of the ministry to the saints. These are the poor saints of Jerusalem. Now, let's keep going down. Watch this. And this they did, not as we hoped. Nothing is better when a preacher says, people get it. And they got it. They got it. Dorothy, that's what people hear when, you, when they hear your car. You get it. You know, they say, oh, well, nothing is better. And I'm sure Paul, he was trying to explain this to them. And they're like, we got you, Paul. We, we get it. We see it. Look at this. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves. There's their hearts to the Lord. They said, Paul, we're not doing this just because you said it. We're doing it because we understand what the Lord is doing. Watch this. And unto us by the will of God. So they submitted to Paul and his, his uh, ministry. Keep reading. Verse 6. In so much that we desire Titus. Now you know who Titus is. Paul wrote a book to Titus about good works. Isn't that interesting that the one who he writes the, one about, the, work, the, the book about good works, Titus, he sends, Titus was a very aggressive personality, unlike Timothy, who was more intimidated, intimidated, uh, lieutenant. Titus was pretty bold in his, when Paul wanted some, somebody to go and put some people in, set them straight, he didn't send Timothy. Because Timothy was, he was a little more timid. I'm more, I'm more like Timothy. I'm kind of in between Timothy and Titus, depending on what it is. But Titus was bold. He would just get up in your face, okay? So he has to send Titus to these carnal Corinthians. But, but, but Titus was surprised when he got there. And Titus, Titus is thinking, I'm going to have to lay the hammer down on these people. Because boy, they... And something happened. Because of the grace of God, because of the word of God and the power of God's word and spirit, working in these saints, at least with this. Watch what happened. In 1 Corinthians, Paul was, he was doing this, and they started getting it in 2 Corinthians. He's like, oh, wow. Okay, watch this. Verse 6, insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, Titus was going to go and take the collection, so he would also finish in you the same what also? Grace. All right. Paul keeps calling this issue the grace of God. He calls giving grace, because ultimately that's what grace is. It's giving to provide. Now, the ultimate giving gift is when God put his son, own son on that cross and he sacrificed him. Because we're going to see that in these verses. But notice the, the issue of grace is, is ultimately giving. Okay? And, and the issue of giving, let me say this, it's not always money. It's giving to provide for needs. It's providing. It's provision. And ultimately, can I tell you what God's going to say? That's what love is. Love is providing for the needs of others. Whether it's their spiritual need. You know how you know I love you? Because I give God's word in me and then share it. But I know you guys love me because you're here and you're laboring with me in this minute. That's love. You're, we're providing for, for each other's spirit, to soul, 
We have something that even those saints who follow by way of we have we can commune one with another. A guy asked me this morning, he says, please uh, have Ryan send me the Q&A's because I feel like a part of it, even through the studies. I know I would even more. I told him it's Q, part Q&A, part, you know, therapy session. <laughs> you know, just, hey, but that's the soul, you know. And then our physical of uh, the bodies, because we actually can hug one another and see one another. The flesh and blood dynamic. There is a flesh and blood dynamic. That's why I told you it's a dynamic to live preaching. And people know that because even people who watch our videos, they, they can't wait until we can actually live feed this thing. Some of them are just going to move here. Because <laughs> that. And so what love is providing for all of this. Love is providing. And God, he provided the greatest thing he had. He, he sacrificed the. God looked around and said, what's the best thing I have? Oh, my son. When God told Abraham to take thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and sacrifice. He said, Abraham, give me the best you have. That was a sacrifice. That was some su We were talking about suffering, right, Dorothy? It's not always physical. The anguish of a father with his son says, I got to kill my son. I mean, uh-uh. But hey, God, God says, hey, Abraham. God was thinking, I'm going to do that for you down the road, right? And watch this. Grace. Verse 7. Therefore, because of all this, as ye what? Abound in everything... Paul was like, you guys are already abound in what? Faith. By the way, these are the supernatural spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians, we would have already learned chapters 12, 13, 14. I'll teach them as the, as the Lord tarries when we're done with Romans. But one of the gifts of the Spirit was faith. Faith that could remove mountains, Paul talks about. He says, so you abound in all these spiritual gifts in faith, in utterance, that's all speaking in tongues, and in knowledge, the gift of knowledge, and in all diligence, all the things that relate to the, to, to the grace of Ministry in life. And in your love to us. Paul says, oh, you claim you love me, huh? You claim you love us, me, Timothy, so forth. Watch what he says. See that ye abound. That's why I call it fruit that abounds. In what? This what also? Notice he calls it again. This grace also starts the chapter off. See, ultimately, what grace is all about is giving to provide for needs. Spirit, soul, and body. Now watch this. Who were the Corinthians doing this to? Two, two entities. The Apostle Paul, as their minister. Actually, they lacked in 1 Corinthians, but they, they kind of picked it up after, after Paul told them. And then the poor saints of Jerusalem. Now today, the only difference is there's no poor saints of Jerusalem there's no little flock today. So you guys, there's only one. You can say this is the grace ministry, Pauline ministry. Let's keep going. Watch this. But here's why. Why, did, why were they pleased? Verse 8. Now get this. I speak not by commandment. The Lord Jesus didn't come to Paul and say, you go tell those carnal Corinthians to, 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 to provide for, for your ministry and for, these, for my poor saints of Jerusalem. He says, teach them about me, what I did. Have them motivated by what I did for them. Watch this. I speak not by commandment, but, but by occasion of the what? Forwardness of others. That word forwardness means the eagerness. To be forward. Uh, Dorothy, you know when they talk about in Galatians, Paul, Paul tells to Peter, Peter asks Paul, says, remember the poor? He says, I was also forward. Dude, that means I was already right. on it anyway. I, I, it, it, it's, and this is eagerness. To be eager did I spell it right? I don't worry about that. Mother, you can't go by the spelling here because I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Or he's going he's gonna to say forwardness, eagerness, that type of stuff, okay? He's like, hey, go, you know what forward means? Go forward. Shoot off. All right, here we go. Verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others. He's trying to give them occasion. Because other people, other grace churches are doing it. Here we go. And, oh boy, to what? Prove the sincerity of your love. Paul is seeking proof that they truly love him in the grace message. You remember Paul says who love his appearing, 2 Timothy. Paul is looking for proof. He's trying to prove, and God through Paul is trying to prove the sincerity. How sincerely do they love 
God and Paul. You know what I've learned? You know those saying, put your money where your mouth is? Oh, dumb lost people. They bet. You know the stupidest thing to do is bet on a ball game. I've done it before, but it's stupid. You can't control the outcome unless you're a, there was that crooked NBA referee who called. And I guess if you're a player, you could. But if you're just some goof on a, on a couch watching a football game, watching the 49ers, and you bet $100 if they win, you can't get, it's stupid. You're going to lose your money most of the time. It's just ridiculous. Right? But everybody talk about putting your money where your mouth is. So if you think your team's better than mine, let's bet on it. Right? Let's put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> well, that's basically what Paul is saying. Do you, you, do you really love me and the Lord? And well, let's prove it. And, and, and to show you that I'm, go down to, go down to the end of the chapter. Verse 24. I'm tell, from, from there to the end of the chapter, that's what he's doing. Right, this is in the Bible. Watch this. Wherefore, show ye to them, and before the churches, the what of your love? He said it again. He said it twice. Two times. My, my point is, this is a serious business. And, and, and I'm going to show you why when Paul says in Romans <coughs> that these people were pleased, pleased verily to give, is because Paul taught them a dynamic of investing that would put any of the Wall Street stocks, bond brokers to shame. You ever had them, to, hey, I got the next best thing, man. It's, it's taking off over in Europe. It's coming over to America. Get in while you can. Man, let me tell you something. That stuff goes up and down. There's an investment that you can make called in the grace of Almighty God that is sure, that is steadfast, and that abounds more than any. whatever. What's the highest you can get on a CD or a rate of return that could promise, hey, 15%? You know. Uh-uh. God says, what you do for me, even though it's not, it's not even the quantity, it's just the quality, it's, it's what's your heart's motivation in, in between you and God. Understand, even what you give, it abounds. Here, watch this. this it blew me away when I see this. That's why Paul's going to say what he says at the end of chapter 9. But let's keep going. Verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but I'm trying to encourage saints. You, you, you wonder, you know, I've had people who say, you know, Ron, I've come out of a religious system, and all I talk about is tithing off, and I said, but, but Brother Ron, I want to know how to give. How, how does God want me to give? And I don't have a lot. I'm poor. That's why I want to just, we're poor, and we don't, we only got, I go, and what I show them is that from, from Paul, and now that I see it even more, as I studied out from, from Romans 15, too, even the little bit you give, if it's based upon how God is prospered, if, if you only have a little, give a little. We don't see that. But what I'm saying is even that little, like that widow's might, all those rich people over there in the temple gave a lot of their abundance, and she gave that little bit of what she had. And, and Christ took note. God took notice. He, th that, that, that matters to God. It doesn't, the amount doesn't matter to him it, if, if it's proportional. What he, it's, he wants you to understand that he'll take that little bit of investment and then just, oh, back. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And the ministry now, I mean, you know. Dorothy and I were talking there are needs There's, we suffer in grace ministries because people in the body of Christ are in ch denominational churches and we go without Ryan shouldn't have to have this burden and Jim and all of us who do all these things it shouldn't be upon one or two or a few people it should be a lot of people adding in joint supply but where are the joints in some other joint in the, the denominational churches that's where they at unfortunately but where are they going to lose out at the judgment seat. And where are those who, of us who sacrifice, and when I say sacrifice, suffer because we don't have our brothers and sisters in Christ helping, where are we going to, who are faithful, we're going to, by the way, all that stuff that they're supposed to be getting, guess what? It's fruit abounding to our account. There is this dynamic in Scripture that he can take from one and give to another. You see that with the parables of the talents and so forth. That's interdispensational. Hey, it's out there for you. Get it. But if you don't, he'll give it to some others who are willing and faithful. Keep that. All right, let's keep going. We're doing great. Let me get my water because I didn't even get to the exciting part yet. Hold on. <laughs> oh, it just gets better. Just like God's word, the more you learn, it just gets better and better. Every day in heaven is going to be better and better. Every day in hell is going to be worse and worse and worse. When you understand God's word, it just gets better and better. Now, what I'm just going to share with you how 
the spirit of God in his word enlighten my eyes of understanding as Ephesians says. I got to unbutton my tie for this. Hold on. Here we go. Okay, verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the fullness of others. Hey, other churches are already doing this. You guys catch up. That's what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. And to prove the sincerity of your love. I want to see how real your love is. I can't claim to love Krista and Jada Land and not provide for them. In fact, I can't even be a minister of gospel. First, Corinthians, First Timothy, Paul says, if a man know not to, how to take care of his own home, how can he take care of the church? I can't stand here and minister and love you guys without first loving Krista and Jada Land. I have to provide for them. But you guys help by providing for our family. That's the reason we're here. Because <laughs> you guys help provide for our rent and for the rent here. That's basically what we, we get. Now watch this. Verse 9, and he goes to the greatest thing he could ever show is how God and Jesus Christ operated towards us. Four, further explanation, verse 9. For ye know the what? Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. Now, how is, how is Christ rich? In the word. Say that in the word. Yes, but well, let me keep reading. Hold that thought. You're, you're right, Chad, but keep reading. Now, let me read it. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So how was he rich then became poor? Well, he had everything in heaven. He left heaven's glory. That's right. Dorothy. No wonder they love you. <laughs> oh, you got it. Glory. He left heaven's glory. He was rich in glory. Right. God who's rich in glory. We know this from Ephesians. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he became Jesus... Paul talks about it in Philippians. He, he was the Lord of glory. Heaven came down. Heaven came down in glory fill my soul. That's the truth. That's what, that's what the word is supposed to do. He left heaven's glory, the riches of his glory. That's what he's talking about. Right. The riches of his glory. He left that throne of glory and came down to be a man. Are you kidding me? A man made of dust? Right. He sacrificed for us. That's what he's talking about. Now watch this. For you know the He says, think about what he did. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he's talking about in heaven's glory. Yet for your sakes, for the, for the believer's sake, he became what? Poor. Poor. Hey, the foxes of the earth have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But what did he say? But the Son of Man have what? Nowhere to lay his head. He didn't even have his own house during his ministry. He would live in other people's house. He'd, he'd stay in the, on, on the Mount of Olives. Nicodemus to come, it was, it was, he came by night. What was Jesus doing up there? Many times says he departed from his apostles and went up to, and what he would do is pray and meditate on the word of God and commune with his father. Then he, they'll say the next day Jesus came down off the mountain. He was out there living, just out there. He was homeless. Wow. Think about this. He became poor. He left heaven's glory as the king of glory. In the Old Testament, he's called the king of glory, the Lord of glory by Paul. And he will be that again. But can I tell you, he left all that, his riches, and became poor, homeless, and died. Why? That we, the believer, through his, what, poverty, might be what? Rich. Now, there's the key. What's the issue? Glory. And what God has given us the opportunity to do is to abound an eternal weight of glory. It has to do with the glory of reigning with Christ as a joint heir. Now keep that in mind. And one of the best ways, yea, the, the quickest way or the easiest, not the easiest, but the quickest way to multiply that is through giving. Watch this. Keep reading. And herein, now watch Paul. He says, I'm going to give you my advice. And when Paul says, I reckon, he's given a personal, he says, let me tell you, I think I have the Spirit of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7. I, I give my advice. If Paul gives you advice, you think you ought to take it? Yeah. You, bet, you can't get a better advisor that's from a human being than the Apostle Paul. Chris and I were invited to our senior. They had senior idol last night. They do all these crazy things at the senior home. And where the seniors, Dorothy, oh, you would have loved it. It was your birthday. Oh, they went back into the 40s, the Big Bang, and they had to, oh, it was fantastic. Way before our time, but... It was pretty cool, wasn't it, dear? Well, they did poems and stuff. And in a, one of the poems, the lady, she was going through all the people. In the, and she says, Ron's my, my knight in shining, shining armor. My savior. Huh? My savior. My, I said, wow, yeah. 
because I, I, I'm the one who drives them to all their doctor's appointments. And one lady just did a whole poem about doctor's appointments. She goes, if you're over 80 and you live in a senior home, doctor's appointments is the way you get out the bed and go do things. You know, it's kind of funny. I'll get, I'll get them for you and probably recite them. But the fact is, we were, let me see, um, what part was it? The what? You were talking about the Paul. Oh, so one guy, he gets up there, 90-year-old guy. He says, I want to read something. He said, I'm going to read about this. It was 2,000 years old, written by a part-time preacher. His name is Paul. And then Crystal looked at each other. I'm glad he got it. He's going to read Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. But me and Crystal look at a part-time. That's our apostle. He's the guy who's supposed to But hey, like Paul says, in pretense or in truth, just the fact that the guy got the Bible verse and he mentioned Paul. Uh, He's been listening to you. I don't know. What's interesting I, he never rolled with me. He still drives. I only drive the people can't. Go. Anyway, but it's just interesting that even in that senior home, they mentioned the Apostle Paul, even though he didn't understand who he was. And they quoted Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? No way. Like. Well, think about something. He says, I give my advice. So listen to Paul, verse 10. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. Now, when Paul uses that term expedient, do you know what that means? Remember he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. He said that early in 1 Corinthians. You remember that? All things are lawful because we're not under the law, we're under grace. But not everything is, that word expedient means beneficial, okay, or profitable. Paul says, I'm free to do things, but if it doesn't profit me at the judgment seat of Christ, what in the world would I do it for? Now, some things are expedient, beneficial, and profitable. What is that? Here we go. Verse 10. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient, necessary, profitable, beneficial for you. Who have begun before, so they had started this collection, 1 Corinthians, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So they had known about this for a year. They were one year. One year, you can collect a lot from among these Gentile churches for the poor saints and some of the provision for the apostles, okay? Now, keep, keep reading. Here we go. Because Paul understands human nature. Sometimes, and Krista gets on me for this, I'm very kind of laid back. I can go either way. I can go either way. The whole reason we were at this thing, after I drove her parents to sex. Her parents left, John and Diane. By the way, thank you guys for uh, uh, ministering to them when they were here on Wednesday. Krista's parents have been here in California for the last two weeks. They just flew back to Minnesota, got in late last night. The two-hour time difference. They called us at 9 o'clock our time, whatever. So it was 11 o'clock. Well, they flew in to San Francisco because her brother Gary lives in Hayward in the East Bay. So Gary picked them up, spent the week there, and then a week with us here in Sacramento. The problem is, they're here in Sacramento, but they fly out of, guess where? San Francisco. So we had to haul, I hauled them out to San Francisco yesterday morning, hour and 45 minutes or 20, 50 minutes. Then I hauled right back. So I told the lady they, at, at, the, at the home, at the senior home, I said, well, we got to take Christmas parents back. It's probably a four hour trip either back, back and forth to San Francisco. If we feel like it, we go. So I get home, I rest a little bit. I say, ah, well, I did it for others. So I can go either way. I'll do things for others. Sometimes Chris will say, can we do this? I say, yeah, I'm okay with doing that. Then I might change my mind. It depends on, I, 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 can, I can go either way. I'll do it if you want to do it. Well, that's what, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you guys said you would do this. Now, this was important. This wasn't some frivolous. This was su- supplying needs for, for saints. You guys said you're going to do it. Look at verse 11. Now, therefore, what? Perform the doing of it. Now, let me throw this little caveat from Philippians 3. If you listen to Paul, Paul says, for it is God which worketh in you both to what? Will and do of his good pleasure. So what did Paul use to motivate them to perform it? He that begun a good work in you will perform it. Philippians 1, the word of God, the spirit of God in them and the word of God through Paul, if they believe it, would be the motivation. Here we go. Verse 11. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it that as there was a readiness to will, they were willing in the beginning. A year ago, so that there may be a what performance also out of that which you have. Okay, he's saying, look, you guys promised this performance. That's the right thing. Verse twelve. Keep going. For if there be first a what willing mind. So what's the first thing God needs? 
willing willingness. He, he, he needs your willingness. God you, gives us free will. We have a choice. God always operates first with your choice. So that's number one. Okay, let's keep going. If there first be a willing mind, it is what? Accepted. Now, the issue of accepted, who, who accepts it? He's not just talking about the saints accepted money. He's talking about the Lord. The Lord will now abound this to your account that we might be accepted. We're accepted in the beloved justification Why? He's talking about a reward issue. When Paul says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that way, that day, fruit of bounty to account, God, the Lord is accepting it in his bank, as it were, his bank of glory. Just stay with me. The first national bank of glory. Oh, yeah, I don't get that. Oh, okay. No. Uh, first universal <laughs> bank of glory. I'm just being funny. But you understand. This is real. It's accepted. He's the teller. Now watch this. This is why I was saying. According or in line with to that a man what? Hath. Yeah. And, and not according to that he hath not. You know why Paul write that? Because yeah. some of them. Go ahead, Leonard. Because he wants to make sure you don't get hooked up into the tides. Yeah, yes, you exactly. The tides was a commandment. And here you give it to according to your ability. Yeah, that, there I it is. Know it's right. Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And look, and there are people who would think. What is my little bit? How's that going to affect anything? It's where your heart is. That's right. And it's, and it's looking up here. It's looking at the judgment seat of Christ. You know why? You know why it matters? Even that little bit, like that widow's might? Yeah. It matters to the Lord. He's trying to... Look, I'm telling you, and Ryan and I know, and Brother Matt, and so, we get brother saints, even in grace men who fight us on this issue of the joint heir and the, and the reign of Christ and the being faithful. But can I tell you, that's what the Lord is putting before us. He wants to share his glory. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's back in Romans 5. He thought of not robbery equal with God. That's Philippians 2. Paul said that. Listen, God, he wants us to build this up, man. He's, he's begging us. He's entreating us through Paul. Beseeching us. Okay, keep going. You were right on. Here we go. Verse 13. For I mean not that other men be eased. You see that? Other men not to be eased. And ye burden. Paul's not trying to put something more on them than others. Equality is the point. Verse 14. But by and what? Equality. All the Gentile churches need to do it together. That's what he's talking about. Okay, here we go. That now at this time... Your abundance may be a supply for their want. Now, the there in the context is still talking about the porcelain. Now, watch this. Y'all sitting down? That their abundance also may be a supply for your want. That there may be an equality. Now, watch this. How did the little flock help the want of these Gentiles? Well, remember what Paul says in Romans 15? For their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their, the little flock's, spiritual things, who did Jesus Christ ultimately belong to? The nation of Israel. He's their, Christ means their Messiah. It is not a huge marvel or thing to, to, to minister to them in carnal needs. What those, and, and during the transition, all those sign gifts and, and all those things that God promised Israel, miracle signs and wonders, were operating amongst the Gentile churches. Those things that belong to Israel, except ye see signs and wonders, ye would not believe Christ says to Israel. Uh, uh, signs were part of Israel's problem. So all these things that were out, now this is during the transition, it belonged to Israel. But God blessed the Gentiles with it. you got to get that. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, where are we at? Verse number 15. By the way, when you're reading Paul, you're reading this, this is what he's saying. Sometimes we just read, but I'm, I, when I read it, I'm glad I'm going to expound on this. Here we go. Verse number 15, as it is written, he that had gathered much had what? Nothing, Nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Now, now where is that from? We're, we're about to see, Leonard. Because when Paul takes you back to the Old Testament, he'll, he'll give you a sign that says, as it is written. So we're going to go there. I don't need to teach the book of Exodus, although we're about to go there. I don't need to teach Exodus verse by verse. All I need to do is teach Paul, and when he goes to Exodus, we can go there. That's on the mount. Oh, Dorothy. Oh, boy. 
So y'all can get me started tonight. Oh boy, there's more. All right, here we go. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. Paul goes back there. There's some Jews at Corinth who, who know this. He quotes the Old Testament in his early epistles like Corinthians. So let's go back there. Go to Exodus 16. Now, Leonard, Leonard allowed me, it was a blessing. I don't normally look at stuff like this, but when saints give it to me, I got a whole line of uh, DVDs to look at. People at the, at the senior home give me DVDs. They just give me DVD. I said, well, once I finish these DVDs, I will lay it out. I got stuff in it. I like just like the word. But Leonard blessed me with three separate DVDs. And you can you can get them on, uh, I told Ryan, you can get them on YouTube as well. All about the Exodus, okay? The Exodus of the nation of Israel out of Egypt and the route of it, but also proof of the Exodus about from Mount Sinai. One verse came up that these people, Jim and Penny, let me let me give them some credit here. They're, they're, they're believers, they're not gracefully, they don't rightly divide. Jim and Penny Caldwell of SplitRockResearch.com. Split Rock, they're talking about that rock that Moses split for the water. You can just see it in your Split Rock Research, Jim and Penny Caldwell. Well, they used one verse from Paul. They don't really listen to Paul, they, they don't rightly divide. But in Galatians 4.25, on, on, on most of the traditional maps, Mount Sinai, they have it in Egypt. Uh, you know, in Africa. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul, God's spokesman, he said this in passing. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Jerusalem. He's talking about Mount Sinai in where? Arabia. Arabia. A throw in, not throw in, but you understand. Paul, that wasn't his point to talk about. Folks on the law, Galatians, the first book, law versus grace. But they, that verse made these people, them and two other guys that literally sure. Say, hey, we need to find the real Mount Sinai because it's not there. The Bible says, Paul, in, Galatia, in, in Arabia. So they went to Saudi Arabia, and guess what they found? You can look at it. In northwest Saudi Arabia, they found all the things that you need. Uh, the bullpen with the animal sacrifice, Aaron's uh, calf, uh, not calf, but the, 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 the uh, idolatrous uh, altar he made, uh, uh, a graveyard for 3,000 people who died, the ashes of the sacrifices. By the way, they found a mountain, two mountains connected, as it were, at the base, but about 4,000 up there is Sinai. You know it because it's all burnt up top where the glory of the Lord came. And then Mount Horeb, both of them in the Bible and the Old Testament called the Mount of the Lord, so forth, right? So you can look at this stuff yourself. But one verse... And when Leonard and I looked at all of them, it's fantastic. You can actually see the mountain burn. You can see the almonds, the Aaron's rod that budded. What might even be the burning bush that Moses saw. It was in the land of Midian. That's the point. Midian's in Saudi Arabia, and Moses was in Midian for 40 years. So I'm not going to get into it. But what I'm saying is, that verse, then they studied the book of Exodus, then they went and lived in Saudi Arabia for 12 plus years to do this. And now they got it on video. So here you can go look at that, okay? Uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell, splitrockresearch.com. The other one was called The Search for the Real Mount Sinai. You can get, to, get that one at explorationfilms.com. But now let's look at the Bible. Go to, go to Exodus chapter 16. Now I'm going to use the next few minutes. We have about 15 minutes. When Paul says, he that gathered much... And he that got it little. Watch this. Exodus chapter 16. By the way, what we're about to read, those people saw this stuff out there. Watch this. And they took their journey, speaking of the children of Israel, from Elam. You know, you know what Elam is famous for? 70 palm trees and 12 wells. Guess what those people found when they left the coast of the Red Sea headed towards Elam? 70 palm trees and, and wells and you know, the wells. Awesome. Awesome. Praise the Lord. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. Isn't that beautiful? The wilderness of sin. What do you think that's all about? <laughs> Which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel praised Moses for getting them out of... Murmured. All murmured. Yeah. Yeah. You're in Egyptian bondage, and, and now what they do? 
This is after the Red Sea. They murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God, we wish God had let us die by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Then we sat by the flesh pots. But they, you know, they forgot about it. Our flesh forgets about the hard times, don't it? They forgot about the beatings of the Egyptians and how they added even more tell or, or counting of, of, of bricks to build their pyramids and all these crazy things, all the, the cities of Ramses and stuff. They forgot about all that. They just remember, hey, we don't have food now, so hey, we remember the flesh pots. Okay, flesh pots. And when we did, verse 3, did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with what? Huh. Is that the reason God brought them out with a mighty hand so he could kill them in the wilderness? No. Really? Or was it to, to fulfill his promise to their father Abraham to let them possess the land of their fathers that show Saudi Arabia? Glory. Show his glory. To show his glory. But that's what the flesh does. Basically, they were Egyptians in their heart and mind with Hebrew flesh. That's all they were. They were Hebrews in flesh, but in their minds and hearts, they were Egyptians. That's why Aaron did all those, these be your gods, O Israel, the you, you know. Keep going. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain what? Bread, Bread from heaven. Now that's the what? The manna. The manna. He rains bread from heaven. In fact, Psalm calls it, man did eat angels' food. Angels eat food. Okay, keep going. I will rain bread from heaven. By the way, type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Moses, your, he tells them, hey, your fathers that eat that bread that perishes, this is the true bread from heaven. Okay? All right. Type of Jesus Christ. For you and the people shall go out and gather a certain... Now, here, here's what I want you to see. Oh, boy. I hope I haven't lost you. Here we go. Stay with me. We're with you. Okay, good. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate. How, 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 how often? Every, Every day. So it's going to be a walk of faith, guys. Here, well, look at this. God, every morning, would rain this mountain. And then it would burn up and be gone. And they had to depend on the Lord. 40 years, 40 years. They had to depend on the Lord saying, Lord, we know you're going to... There's nothing to eat. We ate today, and then we need to know that tomorrow we're going to eat, but God says we will, so we're just going to expect it to be there, and it was. Everybody got that? They, couldn't, they couldn't keep it. We're going to get to that. They couldn't keep it, because he tested them on this. Okay, right. here we go. Right. Okay, a certain rate that I may do what? Prove. Prove them. Now, Paul says the way God proves today is through that giving, through the grace message. The way he proved Israel back there is prove them through the manna. To see if they will obey his voice. Trust him. Trust them. Faith. Walk by faith. Oh, by the way, that account we talk about about the Lord. I told Krista this morning, it's not like an investment account you can get on your computer. Check my funds. Oh, yeah, this is good. Check, check. <laughs> There's no computer to get on to check the, the status. No. You have. We walk by what? Faith, faith and not by sight. We can't see it. But we know from the scriptures that that's what Paul, that's what's going on. Trust the Lord. That's what they had to do. Once that manna left for the day, they had to trust God that it would be there when? Tomorrow. Now watch this. Let's keep going because this is the passage Paul. So he's going to prove them as well. Like he proves the body. Whether they will walk in my law or no. Paul says, I'm going to prove whether you walk in my grace or no. He keeps calling ours grace. <laughs> keep going. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be how much? Twice, twice as much. Why? Because the next day is going to be the seventh, right? So get twice as much. Here we go. As they gather daily. Verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, and that's the evening, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then ye shall see the... Glory of the Lord. you right. You were talking about that glory. It's all about the glory of God. Right. Watch this. Verse 7. For that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we? Speaking of Moses and Aaron, that ye murmur against us. They were God's spokesmen to Israel. And Moses said, this shall be when the Lord shall give you in the even eat flesh to eat. By the way, what was that flesh that they ate? Well... Do you know in those videos, mm. 
You could see the quail right on the, right over on the base of, of Sinai. It, the, the, the Bedouin, the, the people of that region said that the quail would fly over. These little birds would fly over. And as they're making their ascent over the mount, they would get tired. So they, their wings, their bodies would be tired, and they just rest right there. And the people just, to this day, they just walk up and grab the birds and eat them. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. God. Awesome. Watch this. Keep reading. Verse number eight. Ye shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Same thing when you murmur against Paul, you murmur against the Lord. Verse nine. And Moses spake unto Aaron, saying, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for ye have heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness and beheld the what? Glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And so forth. So I'm just, I'm just trying to show you what's going on. Keep reading. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew... That's the man that lay, lay round about the host. And when the dew was that, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is what? Man. So that's where the name comes from. They named it manna. Why? For they wished not what it was. That's the name of it. You know what manna means? <laughs> what is this? Because <laughs> man, they had seen it before. What is it? It was from heaven. To this day, they find materials that are out of our world, away from our, not of this earth. Metals, dust, all, all type of stuff that's not part of this world. And you know, the scientists say, we don't know where this is from, what it is, but we know it's not of this earth. Because there are other planets out there with other materials that stay in this principality, let, let come. You're going to find a lot of that stuff as technology gets better. It's going to be all type of extraterrestrial stuff. Well, that's what this bread was. They're like, what is it? they never seen anything like it. Let's keep going. God thought that was funny. God has a very good sense of humor. Buddy. That's how we got out. Verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, okay, what, verse number 15. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Now, we, we're going to come, coming down to the, to the end of this. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. Right? Okay, according to your ability. An omer for every man. Now, what an omer is, I, I, I want to get this on there because people ask me, well, what's an omer? No. According to the Hebrew Psychopedia deal, an omer is a, a unit of dry measurement, a, a, an omer, is a unit of dry measurement. How, like if a woman has a little measuring cup of, of like flour or something. Dry measurement, me measurement, equivalent to or equal to about five pints. About five pints. So what they would do is they just collect this stuff, five pints of it. And then it could make all types of things with it, okay? That's what an omer is. Let's keep reading. Verse 16, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Okay? So if Leonard's household was four people, one person gets five, so times four is how many pints? 20 or four omers. Everybody got that? He had 20 pints, and that would feed his family for the day until at night they would eat the quail. He didn't, I don't think he gave a specific by quail. You just ate the meat. Well, actually, they ate it to come, coming out the nose, but that's a whole other thing. Breakfast and lunch. Yeah, exactly. Nature. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All right, we got it, we got it. we're coming down in, but I just want you to, why did Paul quote this in 2 Corinthians? Here we go. This is the thing which the Lord God had commanded. Okay. Take ye at the end of 16, every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and, and, and gathered some, what? More. They had more people, some less. Leonard might have five people in this household. Jim, you might have 20. Some more, some less. God provided. Okay, here we go. And when they did meet it with an omer, he, he that gathered much had what? Nothing, Nothing over. 
And he that gathered little had no lack. Now, this will blow you away. God provided the right amount, the exact amount. It's probably upwards of two million folks. Not counting the livestock. Mm -hmm. He provided the exact amount for everybody mm. in that county. Count the hairs on your head. He, exact amount. <laughs> and, and their animals. Now watch this. Well, then on the sixth day, he doubled that amount so that everybody can do what they have to do. Why is Paul saying that? Because as we, we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians in a moment. And I'm going to show you why he goes. Let's just read that again. Verse 18. And when they did meet it, they measured it with an omer. He that had gathered much had nothing over. And he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, let no man leave of it until the morning. Now, you know, some verse 20, notwithstanding. They hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred what? Worms, worms and they stank. Type of, not, of disobedience, and the worms died not. That's type of the, 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 the judgment of God. Moses was wrong. The, the law condemned them. Okay, my point is this. The issue is equality. There is enough if saints are just willing to listen to Paul. There's enough to provide for the entire body of Christ. Dorothy, we started this. One of our laments, Ryan and I, is that saints in the body of Christ aren't faithful to the Pauline truth. Therefore, think there, there's, there are all these needs and sufferings of the grace message where people have talents and gifts that they could do stuff, where everybody could do their part. But that's okay, because for those of us who do what God says through Paul, there's glory. Yeah. All right, let's go back. Let's end in... <coughs> Let's end in 2 Corinthians, okay? Go back to 2 Corinthians 8. Now, we only have three minutes, so I won't be able to finish the chapter, and then we're going to look at chapter 9 next week. But I just want you to see this. Have all this in your mind, and we'll record it. So, by the way, if anybody ever asks you how to give today, we'll have this on record. You just tell them how to show them from this. All right, come on. Go, go on down. Let me see how, how... I think I can just expound on this and then we can pick up chapter 9 next week. Because I want to... Look, look at the end of chapter 9. Look at chapter 9, verse 15. Here's what we're working to. Thanks be unto God for his what? Unspeakable gift. Now, Paul uses the word uns unspeakable. I even looked it up. Greek commentary, all that. He uses it a couple times. Here in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, he uses unspeakable, Right? But then there's another Greek word he's in 2 Corinthians 12, unspeakable. In, both, in this case, it, 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 how we would say it, it's, it's indescribable. Yeah. Paul says, I can't put into words what I'm trying to uh, expound. I want you guys to get it. It's indescribable. This one, this one says, I got it written down here. Pardon me one second. This one is more of, you you can't you you can't you can't utter it you you cannot utter it because of its sacredness sacredness it's so sacred and in the case of this one what Paul heard it, it only belongs where where he heard it in paradise you you can't speak these words on planet earth and and that's the sense of it it's very, it's so sacred it, it was a heaven something that only could take place in the third heaven huh. interesting okay. But Paul heard it. He's trying to tell you about his ministry. Okay? But this one is more of a... Um, undis you, if you can understand this, man, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't put it into words. My, my flesh, he's saying, my human infirmity can't... J just believe me on this because it's working something for your good. And he says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And what it is, it's that grace bestowed on them in chapter number 8. That grace bestowed. That's, what it, that's why I said it's a gift. Most people think it's Jesus Christ. Well, sure, he's the great gift of God. But no, he's, this is not a salvation. This is a sanctification reward issue. God has given us the opportunity of a lifetime. That guy who says, hey, if you invest with me, man, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Paul says, no, no, no. Invest with me. Opportunity of eternity. All right, so let's end.
Let's end uh, chapter number 8. I'm just going to expound on it if we can. Here we go. Verse 15. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over. And he that hath gathered little had no lack. So we saw that from Exodus, the issue of the manna. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. He says, thank God that Titus had the same care that I had for you guys. Titus went there to see them. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation to go collect the money. But being more for Titus, Titus understood what was going on. So he says, I'll do it, Paul. Of his own accord, he went unto you. Titus was like, Paul, I'm going to go do this because I, I, I get what God's doing. Here we go. And we have sent with him the brother. So there was another man that went with Titus, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Now, they don't mention this guy. But whoever this man was, this brother, he was known throughout all the churches. Verse 19, and not, only, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this what? He, you see this, this issue of giving has to do with grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord. So whoever this brother was, he was a member of the little flock. He represented the little flock. That's why he says the glory, Dorothy was right on, the glory of the, you see what he says, the same Lord. Paul uses this in 1 Corinthians 1. He'll talk like that about the little flock, about the Lord Jesus. He'll say, you know that group of little flock and us, the body, we have the same Lord. That's what he means. All right. Everybody got that? So not only was members of the body involved, Paul and Titus, there was a faithful member of the little flock involved. Everybody got that? All right, we're about to end. Stay with me. Okay. Verse 19, and declaration of your ready mind. So you, have, you were ready. Avoiding this, that no man should be blame us in this abundance which administered by us, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You know what Paul is saying? Paul wasn't going to steal the money. But just so the little flock could know that every bit of that collection from these Gentiles was going to the little flock, Paul says, get one of your faithful members of the little flock, whoever you choose. Send him with Titus. They watch him collect it. He goes with Titus to take it. He went like Judas to take it to back to the little flock. In other words, he's saying, send one of your own. Let him watch the whole process. Walk with it. So he'll go with, with, with Titus over here to Achaia and then back down to Jerusalem. Send one of your own guys. Everybody got that? All right, let's end. Verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, speaking of Titus, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, now we know who Titus is, read the book of Titus. He is my what? Don't you want Paul to say you're his partner? Oh man. I would love, we get to the rapture and Paul, he's there, he says to us, my partners. Oh. And fellow helper concerning you. Or our brethren be acquired of. They are the messengers of the churches and the, what's that word? Glory of Christ. Everybody got that? There's some glory involved in this interchange of giving. So keep, keep looking at grace, glory. Go. All right, we got in. Verse 24. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches. Show those brothers, show those churches, of, of those, those uh, churches of the Gentiles and also that gathering of the Jews, watch this. The what of your love, proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Now we got to end. We'll pick up chapter 9 next week because it goes with it. You see how it starts off? For anytime you see that word for, it's further explanation of what he just said. So we'll look at that next week. Here's my point. Oh boy. I don't want you to be discouraged if you only have a little to invest in the grace message. And I want to encourage you, if you've been thinking, hmm, should I trust the Lord to do this? I don't have a lot. Well, remember what Paul says about, it's not, it's, God's going to make sure it's not a, a burden. It's a sacrifice, but it's not going to be a burden. If you understand what is awaiting at the judgment seat, and not only that, you want a great submission, it, 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 it's our Father's business. But he's saying, if you understand what I'm trying to show you, and you're going to see it next week as well in chapter 9. We'll finish 9. 
You're going to say, oh boy, thank you, please, Lord, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. It doesn't matter the amount. What matters is the heart intent and where it goes if it's invested right in the grace of God. I thank God for you saints. I thank God for you saints. <coughs> because we couldn't be the ministry we have without all of you giving in some way, both in your time, your talent, as well as your treasure. But when it comes to that, that thing means a lot to God right there, the proven sincerity of your love. And it's not the amount. It's between you, how God has prospered you. It's the heart understanding these things. And so next week, I'm going to tie it up in chapter 9. And with you and me, I want to, to say with the Apostle Paul, thank God for his unspeakable gift, okay? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that as we study out the book of Romans, and we can understand now why the Apostle Paul says it pleased them, Macedonia and Achaia, because we read the epistles he wrote previous to Romans, First and Second Corinthians, we can see it. But Father, there's more to see. Your first unspeakable gift is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's indescribable what he's done for us. We won't even know until e eternity future. But right now, Father, we can now be fellow laborers, fellow partners with the apostle, with these saints here in the Bible. We're, we're, we are part of Bible times because we're, we're the body of Christ. And we serve our generation today just like Paul did in his day. Oh, Father, may our hearts desire to be a part of what you're doing, knowing that everything we give of our time, our talent, our treasure goes towards the funding of your ministry and for the minister to, uh, to live and take care of the needs. But also, Father, it's fruit that abounds to our account. Thank you, Father, that we can be a part of what you're doing both now and in the age to come. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.